is up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Red Chip Poker Podcast. This is Coach Weasel. Today, I'll be your host. And we're going to be talking about the topic, where does your win rate come from? I'd like you to imagine a situation where you've been battling it out against one of the other regs at your limit. And you have a pretty good idea that you are slightly better than him. You've seen some of the things that he's doing and they don't quite stack up from a theory point of view. But every time you have a look at your win rate over the sample, you see that you don't appear to actually be making any money against this player. And yet you're convinced that you must be better than him. This leads us to one of the unfortunate truths of poker in general, and that is you can't always win against players who are worse than you. Now, what's going on here? Is it simply that we're running bad? Yes, we are the more skilled player, but our opponent is just catching a few lucky cards. No, in reality, he's not winning either. In military terms, we have an expression MAD or MAD, and it's an acronym that stands for Mutually Assured Destruction. And it refers to the idea that in some confrontations, neither party is going to win. Think about an all-out nuclear war between two countries. The end result is simply that they are both going to destroy each other. There's going to be no real winner in the long run. Now, in the case of poker, the thing that makes that a reality is the rake. To take an example, think about low-limit online games. The rake measured in big blinds per hundred hands can sometimes be 10 big blinds per hundred hands or more. As we move up limits, the amount of rake we pay in big blinds per hundred usually decreases, but of course it does depend on the site. And if you're playing live, it does depend on the casino. Let's just say for argument's sake that we are paying eight big blinds per hundred in rake at a certain network. And here we are battling out against this reg who is fairly okay at the game, but seems to be slightly worse than us. Even if we are better than our opponent, there's a very good chance that we are not eight big blinds per hundred better than our opponent. Let's say it turns out we actually have a fairly big edge. And if we were to play against that opponent in a zero rake environment, we would be winning at five big blinds per hundred, despite him being an okay wreck. Well, that sounds great. But if we're paying eight big blinds per hundred hands in rake to the poker room, then we have a problem because our net win rate is going to be minus three big blinds per hundred hands. Our opponent's in an even worse situation because he's paying that eight big blinds per hundred hands to the poker room, but he's also losing against us at five big blinds per hundred hands. That means his net win rate is going to be minus 13 big blinds per hundred hands despite the fact that he's only a minus five big blind per hundred hand loser when he's playing against us. So when we're battling it out against other regs whom we consider to have a fairly similar skill level to us, unless the rake is extremely low in our environment, there's a very good chance that we're both simply losing against the rake when we play against each other. The only entity that's benefiting in that scenario is the poker room itself. And this leads us to an important truth. It doesn't matter how good you are at the game. The majority of your win rate is always going to come from recreational players. It's not even going to come from regs who are slightly worse than you and you're definitely exploiting them in a few areas of the game tree. Even a slightly worse reg is very likely to bring about that mutually assured destruction scenario. We need players who are significantly worse than us in order to overcome the cost of playing, the rake that we're sending to the poker room. Now, to give an example of this in practice, if you have a look at lower limit games online up to about 50 NL, they are often flooded with bots. It's fairly easy to purchase a bot online these days. Don't recommend it simply because it's unethical. It's against the terms and conditions of the site. And many of these bots are not great. Some of them maybe have a marginal win rate against the pool at the lowest limits, maybe a big blind per hundred hands, something like that. Of course, if you leave the bot on running for months on end, you might make a few hundred bucks as a result. 
But some of these bots are slightly losing. They're just not coded very well. They maybe have a minus two, minus three big blind, 100 hands loss rate in some cases. And as a human player who's sticking to the terms and conditions of the site, this might seem like a good thing. You're playing on a low limit online site the site creators don't care about the ethics of allowing players to run bots. In fact, they like having bots because it boosts the site's revenue because bots pay rake like everyone else. It might seem like a good thing as the player. We have all of these bots who are marginal losers. Maybe they end up making a small amount after rake back or something like that. And we think to ourselves, well, a room full of slightly losing players well, that's good. It means we can generate a positive win rate, right? Not necessarily. You might be better than these poker bots, but you're not necessarily eight big blinds per 100 hands better than these poker bots. And if you think about having a poker bot where we maybe break even after rake, let's say we can win eight BB per 100, we then ship that eight BB per 100 off to the poker room. Would you rather have that player sitting across the table from us? Or would we rather have a recreational player? And just to give some context here, it's definitely conceivable that the win rate of a professional player against a very poor recreational opponent could be in the region of 20 to 30 big blinds per 100 hands. Now we're completely crushing the amount of rate that we have to send to the room. If we're beating a recreational player at 30 big blinds per 100 hands, who cares if we're sending eight big blinds per hundred to the room? In fact, who cares if we're sending 12 big blinds per hundred to the room if the tables are full of players whom we have a 30 big blind per hundred hands edge against? It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter if you are the best reg at your limit in your games. The majority of your win rate is still going to come from the recreational players and you'll very often end up losing against weaker regs, not because they're better than you, but because we don't beat them at enough of a clip to overcome the rake we pay to the poker room. Now with this in mind, it makes sense to restructure the way we think about taking profits from the tables. We really want to be in that situation when we have a 20 big blind per 100 win rate differential between us and one of the recreational players at our table. In fact, we want our tables where possible to be full of players where we can generate that win rate differential against. Now, unfortunately, that's usually not going to be realistic. In most cases, we might have one or two recreational players at the table, and then the other players at the table might fall into that weak reg category, where, yeah, we're better than them. However, we might not be profiting by playing against them over the long run because of rate costs. In some cases, there may be some very good regs who actually generate a positive win rate against us. And that's obviously not a great situation because we lose chips to them and then we have to pay the poker room for the privilege of doing that. The presence of these weak regs and strong regs is not a problem. So long as we maximize the number of hands we play against the weaker players at the table. So this is where thinking about the tricks we have in our tool set for increasing the number of hands we play against weaker players comes into play. Now the most obvious technique that we use is ISO raising. Weak players limp, we ISO raise to get the action heads up. So that's maybe the most obvious. Let's spend a few minutes thinking about other ways that we can increase the volume of hands we play against weaker players. Another thing to look out for is increased cold calling ranges, especially in the big blind. Now I've had discussions in the past where a player's perhaps been in middle position and a weaker player in UTG has decided to open raise. Let's say they open raise UTG for three big blinds and our hero is in MP with something like Jack 8 suited. And the question will be, obviously I don't normally cold call Jack 8 suited in this spot, but I can see my opponent who's open raising UTG is a recreational player. So can I expand my cold calling range to include something like Jack 8 suited? In most cases, the answer is no. We can't really expand our cold calling range that significantly 
when there are so many players to act behind us. The big blind is an exception, however. That's because we don't need to worry about anyone behind us who's going to squeeze or overcall. And we can get away with dramatically expanding our cold coin range in the big blind when a recreational player has open raised. This is why it's really important not to blindly follow preflop charts. It's very useful to have preflop charts, by the way. Everyone should have a default baseline strategy for their preflop decisions. Having said that, if we were to always stick blindly to a very specific big blind cold calling range, we would be missing a large number of opportunities to increase the number of pots we play against the recreational player. And potentially we can go very wide with this. I mean, if we imagine an extreme example where Button min raises and Button is a very weak player, I don't really see myself folding that much at all in the big blind. I might occasionally fold some very weak offsuit garbage like 8-3 offsuit, but anything remotely playable that has a high card, some kind of connectivity, I would never be folding in that spot. If I had a queen-5 offsuit, it would be a snap call, regardless of whether it's in our standard defending range, because we get this opportunity to play pulse flop against a weak player at a very good price. Another technique for increasing our volume against weaker players is small blind completing. Now there are two scenarios for this. The first one is a heads up situation where it's folded around to us in the small blind. If we have a look at the big blind and it turns out that he is a very weak recreational player, it's recommended that we should play 100% VPIP in that spot, 100% of holdings. Now we don't necessarily want to be open raising 100% of hands, that might be too wide, but with the option to small blind complete, we get to see lots of additional flops against the weaker player. So it's folded around to its preflop. We're in the small blind with eight deuce offsuit. We see the big blind's a recreational player. We should be completing in that situation and trying to see a cheap flop. Because if we do flop two pair or trips, then our opponent is bad enough that he's going to be paying us off with a high frequency pulse flop. The second scenario for small blind completing is multi-way. Let's say for example, that a player in MP open limps. We're in the small blind, we have something very marginal, like five, six offsuit, for example. We have a look behind us. The big blind doesn't seem super aggro. Maybe the big blind is also a recreational player. Now, sometimes players might look at that hand and say, well, I'm either going to be raising or folding preflop. I obviously can't ice a raise with five, six, even against a recreational player. It's too wide, and that would be correct. But then their assumption is because they're not going to ice a raise that they should just be falling in that situation instead. Completing is very cheap, it's just half of a big blind, and in that scenario we then potentially have access to two recreational players pulse flop. That's a very good situation for increasing our win rate. The really nice thing about playing against recreational players is sometimes you really just don't need to do that much. It can just simply be a case of completing with our 5-6 offsuit. If we flop really well, such as 2 power better, we can extract value. If we completely miss, then often it's okay to just give up and do nothing. The implied odds when we hit will more than make up for the fact that we miss a decent amount, even if we also just give up every time we miss. It's going to be very profitable for us in the long run. Another option that players don't necessarily think about is the technique of limping behind. Poker schools have long conditioned us to avoid thinking too much about the option of limping. We have it drilled into us that limping is always bad. But this actually refers specifically to open limping. If we're first to act in a non-small blind position, limping is usually not the right option. But there are many other situations where we're given the option to limp, where it's not an open limp scenario. We've already spoken about one, which is small blind completing. This doesn't fall into the same category as open limping. Even though a small blind complete could technically be considered an open limp, it's acceptable to do it. In fact, it's a correct part of GTO poker to have a completing range in the small blind in a heads up scenario. Another situation where it may be correct to think about limping is when there has already been another limper before us. So imagine this situation, we're on the button, we have our 5-6 offsuit again, cut off open limps. We look down at our cards, we decide that we can't really ice raise in that spot. It makes sense, our hand is not very good, legitimately. We don't want to be ice raising in that spot. 
Once again, we check behind us because we don't really want to be limping behind too much if there are very aggro good players behind us. That's going to make it harder. The ideal incarnation of this is we actually have weaker players in the blinds as well, or one weak player in the blinds, and then maybe a passive weak reg as well. We can think about limping behind on the button with our 5-6 offsuit, or whichever somewhat speculative hand we have that's not quite strong enough to ISO. So it could be something like a Jack-7 suited, or a 5-3 suited, or a 10-8 offsuit, these types of holdings. Anything that increases the volume of hands we play against weaker players is going to be good for our win rate in the long run. Think about it as a ratio of number of interactions between the regs versus number of interactions against the fish. To put some arbitrary numbers to this, imagine that we had 10 battles against a reg for every one battle we have against a recreational player. What do you think the chances are that that overall strategy ends up being losing? Now imagine we have 10 interactions with a recreational player for every one interaction we have against a reg. There's a fairly high chance that's going to be a winning prospect in the long run. In fact, we might not even be that good at poker, but we can probably make that scenario winning in the long run. The size of the mistakes that our opponents are making on average is simply going to make it quite straightforward to generate a positive win rate overall. Final technique is that of ISO 3-betting. So we may sometimes 3-bet slightly wider than we would ordinarily because the opener is a weaker player. And we want to try and get that weaker player to ourselves rather than just cold call and then maybe one of the decent reg squeezes behind. If we three bet ourselves, we may sometimes shut down the action from the good players behind and find ourselves in a heads up scenario with the weaker player all to ourselves. Let's think for a moment about those stronger players in the player pool. Let's just say, for example, that we're aware that we're not the best player in the player pool and there are some villains who actually give us problems on a day to day basis. This is not actually a problem because our profits were never coming from those players anyway. In fact, we probably don't need to play so many hands against opponents who we know they've maybe got us figured out. For whatever reason, they seem to be outmatching us in the various post-op situations we find ourselves in. It's not a problem. That doesn't mean we can't generate a positive win rate. Because even if those players were actually slightly worse than us instead, our win rate's still not coming from those players. It has so much more to do with the ratio of interactions versus the recreational players compared to number of interactions versus the recs. We could actually have a player who is in the same player pool as us, better than us in general in terms of theory and standard lines, but because they don't have their ratios sorted out, whereby they're not deliberately targeting the weaker players, perhaps they're even deliberately going after the weaker regs in the player pool. They could technically be better players than us, but generating a worse win rate. Whereas if we're focusing on that ratio, number of interactions against the fish versus number of interactions versus the regs, we can generate a very healthy win rate, even if we're not the best player in the pool. And if you just take high stakes as an example, if we think about the way that a game will form around a single weak player at the table, the action won't even run until that weak player shows up because the other regs know where their win rate comes from in that case. They will of course play against each other if they have a hand, but they don't necessarily expect to have a large win rate differential against each other. The fact that they can have more interactions against a weaker player when that weaker player is at the table makes the overall game profitable for them. In the modern game, it's common for players to be concerned regarding the presence of GTO bots. We know that players have access to solved game trees, and we know that an individual who is savvy with technology might find a way of linking those solved trees to their poker client, to the point where the poker client becomes a bot. It just plays perfect or very close to perfect GTO poker based on those pre-solved solutions. And players get a little bit panicky about that. They're concerned that it means that poker is dead. Players have found a way to 
cheat and play perfect GTO poker, there's no point us playing anymore because we're not good enough to beat a perfect GTO bot. Once again, it's not a problem. If this is a very small percentage of the player pool, firstly, our win rate was not coming from them anyway. But secondly, it's not a prerequisite to having a positive win rate. We don't need to be able to beat everyone in the player pool. Even if we had a super user sitting at our table, and this has happened in the past, by the way, you can check out the ultimate bet and absolute poker scandal if you're interested in a bit of poker history. Even if we had a perfect opponent who could see our whole cards, this doesn't necessarily mean that we can't play profitably at that table. Sooner or later, we'd figure out, for whatever reason, this guy's got our number, he's beating us consistently. We'd limit the number of interactions we have against that opponent while looking to maximize the number of interactions we have against the weaker players at the table. As you can see, when we're thinking about our win rate in the right way, when we understand where our win rate really comes from, it frees us up to maximize our win rate and do very well, even in environments where there's a decent number of better players than us, we can still maximize our possible win rate. As we've discussed in this podcast, the most profitable players are not necessarily the most skilled. The most profitable players are the ones that maximize the number of interactions they have against the significantly weaker players at the table. And that's not just to do with game selection, i.e. which table we play, but it could also have a lot to do with room selection as well. All right, thanks for listening, guys. Hope you find this information helpful for improving your win rate. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Poker Podcast.